looking at the home of President James Polk, the 11th President of the United States. We're in Columbia, Tennessee. <clears throat> we were in Nashville looking for something to do, so we popped down here. It's a lot longer drive than I thought it would be. There's his wifey. So, we decided to come down and take a look. Check it out. Pretty cool. Okay, we're gonna look around. Okay, so we just got here in time for a tour, so that's what we're gonna do. And we'll be back. Now this beautiful piano forte, I saw you, are you a musician? No, no, we were in rugby a couple of weeks ago. Rugby, they Tennessee, have they have piano just like this in that shape. I, in, this is called a piano forte. In music, <clears throat> piano means soft Yeah, they have one just left. like it there. So it was, it's able to play those two dynamics, but it's the keyboard of the time. It's either got 46 or 60 more keys on it. Now, what happens is, is this was shipped from England in 1815 to Sarah's parents, the Childresses, living in Murfreesboro. And Sarah learns to play beautifully on it. She had a favorite song as a young girl growing up. So my first question, and if you don't have the answer, it's okay. Does anybody know the name of the song that's played when the president enters the room? See how smart you are? It was originally a Scottish fiddle tune called Hail to the Chief Ten. We steal a lot from the Scots and the Irish. And Sarah loves to play this song. It had been played for presidents prior to James K. Polk once in a while. Not all the time. But Sarah notices that when James becomes president and he walks into the room, he was only 5'7", he doesn't stand out in the crowd, and he also doesn't like talking to anybody because he's a workaholic and that's all he cares about. He wants to get all of his campaign promises done and leave office. Well, so nobody knows. So she has it played at every entrance and that starts the tradition of Hail to the Chief. She played Hail to the Chief on this piano forte as a young girl. So it's kind of an interesting little fact there. Next time you hear it, you saw the piano it was played on. <laughs> well, also, Sarah, when they purchase a home called Polk Place in Nashville, it's a great big mansion, and the house that they will live here in Columbia, which is gone now, everything's gone, is two blocks up the street. It was a small cottage. Polk Place was a mansion. So when she's first lady, she's busy buying furniture for her new home. So while she's in the White House from a company in New York, she purchases these side chairs, the marble top tables, the sofas, the armchairs for her new home 
in full place to furnish it. So today on tour, we call it the White House Collection, but it's not been documented they've ever been used there. They were just purchased there. And from another company in New York, she purchases this lighting fixture and the one in the dining room, which she will prefer candles over the gas lighting of the White House because she didn't like the smell. And also, when you go in an historic home, all you see is mirrors all over the place. If it's an elegant home, it's not so much a log cabin. See these two mirrors there? They'd be called a pier mirror, placed between two windows to reflect light. That's really what they were used for. So these people were really smart in that as well. And this beautiful table is something that James is extremely proud of. We're never going to see anything like it again. The marble slab part was a gift from the ambassador with the Navy, Dr. Heath. In fact, the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland is started in October 10, 1846 under James K. Polk's administration. He's very wanting the young men to get a good education. So this is presented to James by that ambassador in Tunisia. All the marble comes from the ruins of Carthage in the original colors. Wow. And James will thank Dr. Heap's son, who at that time was in Pennsylvania for this gift, and how he wants it to be made into a table to sit in his parlor at Cole Place. And it was, as you can see. Now, it's got all the examples representing America. We have 30 stars surrounding the eagle, which represents 30 states. Okay, now, interesting, the flag is gonna change several times while James is president. Only in four years, when he first becomes president, Florida was admitted to the Union under John Tyler's administration, but the star's not on the flag. That's sewn on in 1846, James is president. Then he adds Iowa, Wisconsin, and Texas. Every time you add a state, you add a star. When he leaves office, it's 30 stars. And if you want to look that up, it looks a lot different than what it does today. It looks, of course, not as many stars, but the design of it's kind of strange. Now, it has all the examples representing America, but it has a mistake on the table. So here's my clue. Thinking about what represents our country, what's wrong with the picture? And don't count or read anything, because all that's okay. It's not wheat, is it? What, man? Isn't that supposed to be wheat in his claw? Well, that is arrows for war. No, the other one. That's an olive. That's branch. olive, okay. okay. <clears throat> Think about what represents our country. Yes, what's oh, wrong? Yeah, that's not a ball. Oh, that's all of right. all the eagles. <laughs> See, that should have a white head and a white tail. Yeah. You want to know why yeah. it doesn't? Yeah. So do we. It's the mistake that we can look at forever, <laughs> but you'll never see anything like it again. Well, Sarah's very proud of this table, and after James passes, she makes sure everybody sees it when they come to visit her, just like we're doing today. So that helps represent. Now there's myths passed around in history. The first myth that I'm going to bust for you is that people were shorter back then. Now James was shorter for his, for the, his day because George Washington was over six feet, so was Andrew Jackson and Lincoln. And they say the average difference in height is only about an inch and a half. Hmm. One of the reasons they attribute that is because the headers on the doors <coughs> for some of you taller men Sometimes you have to duck, especially in a log cabin, but that's not the reason why. It's not the height of the person. It's because the narrower and the shorter the opening, the more heat from the fireplace stays in that room. So that's kind of like their central heat back then, kind of helps. And another myth <coughs> is this table right here, also part of our collection. This is known as a petticoat table. So I can check to make sure I'm properly dressed in that mirror there at the bottom of the table. That sounds great, right? Sounds really good. And I had actually asked antique dealers if that's what that is, how come no matter where I stand, I can't see myself if that's what that is? Because that's the myth. That is a pure table like the pier mirror specifically placed there to reflect light. Smart people. Now if you turn that way, you'll see two portraits of James and this one of Sarah 
were painted by the famous artist George Healy. These are their presidential portraits. I do get asked, are they the real thing? Yes, they are. Wow. They were able to keep these. Now this is James when he first becomes president. At the time he does, he's only 49, so he's the first man under 50 to become president. And he will say, the 14 to 15 hours to pose for this portrait was time unprofitably spent. I need to be working, not sitting here posing for a portrait. And look at his face. To me, he looks a little bit irritated. <laughs> well, I'm glad he did. And James Buchanan, his Secretary of State, he becomes president later, says he's the most laborious worker he ever met. And in the span of four years, he has the appearance of an old man. That's a good quote, but this is two and a half years later. James has aged so much that a lot of times people will ask me if that's his father. Now, daguerreotypes are popular during the 1840s. That's the form of photography. We have the first photograph of the White House outside of it taken when James is president. The first photograph of the president inside the White House is taken. We have something to compare it to. And actually, the daguerreotypes really kind of look worse than that. And they were able to touch him up to make him not look so haggard. So did George Healy. So he probably looks better than he actually did. Well, he works night and day to get all of these accomplishments made. And it takes a big toll on him. But some of the interesting facts that happen while James is president is he will lay the cornerstone of the Washington Monument on July 4th, 1848. Helps establish the Smithsonian Institution. Of course, we have the Naval Academy. All these states are added, the sewing machine is patented, lots of literature written, Edgar Allan Poe is writing really strange stories during that time. The country is changing a lot. And why don't we know more about him? He only serves one term, and he's sandwiched between Jackson and Lincoln. We have a war that's fought, the war with Mexico. Nobody knows very much about it. Six regiments of young Tennesseans. That's about 6,000 young Tennesseans joined to fight for duty and honor during this war. And we will be nicknamed the Volunteer State because of that. And all those famous Civil War generals, they were there on the same side. So they get their training ground there. Well, it only lasts about two years. And shortly before the war ended, with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2nd, 1848. In January, they strike gold in Sutter's Mill in California. Well, that's a big deal because the treaty puts that territory in our possession. But nobody knows about it because news doesn't travel. At James K. Polk's last State of the Union address, he will announce large amounts of gold have been found in California. And that starts the California gold rush. Now this was the West during those days, but now it's gonna go out to the real West. And in this county, we see many, many wagons coming here from all areas to go out West in search of that gold. It's a big transition there. Now James works laboriously. <coughs> Works all the time. In fact, they bring a little bed, a little sleigh bed, up to his office at the White House that he's supposed to rest on. And I don't think that he can be there very much. But he worked so hard that Sarah's really concerned when he does leave office. They'll make a trip through Tennessee and come here and then end up at Polk Place. And during that time, in his weakened condition, he will contract cholera. There was a huge cholera epidemic in Tennessee, and nobody knows about it in those days from drinking water. But they don't know that until much later. So anyway, he will die of cholera about three weeks after they arrive at Polk Place. So his long, happy retirement turns into the shortest retirement of any president of only three months. Now, Sarah, however, has the longest widowhood of any First Lady of 42 years, remaining in black the whole time. But she has a beginning. She's around eight years younger than James. She is considered to be very beautiful, like a Spanish Donna with the dark hair and dark eyes, very fashionable. And James is going to tell her she has too many dresses, but that <laughs> didn't work. She had two for the inauguration. 
very well educated, and she helps James tremendously through all of his campaigning. Now, she never has any children, so politics is her baby. But she's got something going for her that time on property spent James doesn't have, and that is that she is sociable. So the politicians prefer talking to Sarah than James, and she can get a lot done that way. And it makes her as one of our most prominent first ladies to take. So if you want to follow me into the dining room, Now the dining room really will play an important part to the folks when they did live about two blocks up the street. The one thing that it would when they had important guests come, such as Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, both presidents, and even David Crockett, they will come here for their formal dining. And Sarah will visit here a lot when James is away at Congress because she has no children, so she'll come and eat her dinner with her mother-in-law, and her closest friend is Jane Mariah. So I do like to point out that even though we don't have a presidential site like other ones do, like Andrew Jackson, we have the next best thing, because there's history here, and there's their things here, so it makes it more interesting. Now Sarah becomes the first lady, of course, when James becomes president, and she's a strict Presbyterian. So things are going to change a lot. Her predecessor, Julia Tyler, is this young, frivolous, young girl that likes men spitting in the tobacco juice in the corners of the White House, has all these fancy balls, entertaining, highly into all that. And here comes Sarah, who doesn't dance at her husband's inauguration, doesn't believe in dancing, doesn't have the balls, only fine wine at her dinners. She's just completely the opposite. And by the way, they don't like each other. <laughs> they don't like each other at all. But the other ladies in Washington, you know how the ladies of society can be, think she's just a country bumpkin from the little town of Murfreesboro in Tennessee, which, by the way, was the capital of Tennessee for a while. So they're thinking not much of her. And she shines because she really does have, she was raised wealthy, she knows stuff. She has this beautiful White House china design. It's honoré from France. The fruit bowl is one of them. The first first lady to put the presidential seal on the White House china. And today, it's known to be some of the most beautiful of all the collection that's still at the White House. And the reason that we have original pieces here is because they, at those days, actually purchased it themselves. So we do have, these are the real deal. These are some of her personal dishes right here, still the different flowers, you can kind of swerve around and peek at them. Now Sarah's mentor, everybody had political mentors back then, but I love this mentor, was Dolly Madison. She's going to live two blocks from the White House while Sarah's there. And Dolly Madison's the first lady that's looking out the window to see the British approaching to burn the White House down and saves that portrait of George Washington. And you can imagine what she had to tell her. Of course, she was a lot older. But she will help Sarah through all this in Washington. And that's where she gets a lot of her ideas from. And for you ladies, Dolly Madison wore the turbans. That was the popular headwear in the 1812 era. You can see Sarah's turban. She kind of establishes that as well in the George Healy portrait. Now the silver is some of the Polk collection as well as the crystal. And as you can see, we have this food to represent one of Sarah's dinners. And her goal during her dinners was not entertaining people, but sitting people together to engage in political conversation. So she'd have these very elaborate dinners, 60 to 70 courses served one at a time, whatever that means. And this one's kind of demonstrating a dinner that was described as lasting four mortal hours, over 150 courses served one at a time. You can imagine James sitting there for all that time. Checking his time, he's saying, how much longer do I have to sit here? Well, I don't really know what that means, but we know they did have Charlotte Roost cake, but it's probably a very small piece. Fruits and nuts and cookies and things and dessert wines. That was their deal. Now, if you ever wondered if they had crock pots, 
They did, non-electric ones, but that's just a joke for me. Have to keep it interesting. <laughs> These beautiful covered dishes were also part of the pool collection. And right above the crock pots, James might get mad at me one day and come out of that painting, but stay there. This is James in his younger year and Sarah. Don't look like the George Healy or the Daguerreotypes at all. They look strange, especially for Sarah. There is a funny story, but you get a short, brief history lesson before I will tell you the story behind this painting. Okay, so James is a seven-term congressman. He's the only man that's Speaker of the House before becoming president. He's elected governor of Tennessee in 1839. Two years later, he runs again against a man who's tall, skinny, and funny. Are you funny? His name was Lean Jimmy Jones. And James, of course, is not funny. He loses. Then he decides I'm running again. He comes back up the street, tells Sarah I feel great about this election because now I have humor in my speeches. But it really wasn't very good. He loses to lean Jimmy Jones again. They'll nickname him the Dark Horse Candidate because they feel like he's a washed up candidate. And Henry Clay is elated that that's his opponent and says mockingly, who is this James K. Polk? Look at my career, he can't even become governor again. And he barely wins the presidency during those years. Why? Western expansion. And while he's president, we go east coast to west coast. More land acquired than any other president before or after him. A very significant character. Well, he has another nickname, Napoleon of the Stump, because he was good at his speeches, just not funny. The Dark Horse Candidate and another nickname after his political mentor. So I'm going to include y'all in this tour. Who's our seventh president? Anybody know? He's on the $20 bill. Does that help? Andrew Jackson. There you go. Andrew Jackson was nicknamed. Anybody know that? Okay. Guess what James's was? Opposite of old is other one. Young. Young. Young Hickory. Okay, so there's another nickname. And he'll visit Andrew Jackson many times at the Hermitage. Well, this painter, Ralph Earl, visits and lives at the Hermitage many times with Andrew Jackson. And he paints very many portraits of Andrew Jackson. <clears throat> but unfortunately, sometimes when he painted other people, whether it's intentional or not, Andrew Jackson gets in there. If you make both your hair white, see how their faces are longer and the nose are longer? We have Jackson and Horace Sarah. You look like Andrew Jackson and the girl. <laughs> well, it happens to other people as well. So the moral of the story is if you want to look like Andrew Jackson, I think I'll pass on that one. Hire Ralph Earl. There you go. And the funny thing, James was poor on his humor. This was his favorite painting of Sarah. <laughs> I feel sorry for Sarah. I wouldn't like that. Now this lady here is Jane Knoxville, the mother of Jane. She's going to be really fortunate because she has 10 children and they all live to be adults. That's rare. But she loses her husband Samuel in 1828. They believe it was of cancer because he calls for morphine. That's all we know. But she also loses seven of her children before she passes in 1852. They both will pass away in this house, and I've never seen them pass on her state. But um, Samuel and James, the back door, they did the three years of work for Samuel. They come in here So that's what you got to see. You found him. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Oh, house. I'll have to get some better pictures of that. <clears throat> okay, so for the people that join the tour at the end, you, when we go in, you can go in through the kitchen and you can pay 
there and then there's a short video you can watch and I'm Sarah in the video. So see you had a fake Sarah to take you on tour. <laughs> you didn't even know that. <laughs> okay, so just come in here. Here we go. Kind of out of the sun. Nobody get blinded. Did you think that was a strange guy hanging up there? I did when I first went on tour. I thought, why is he up there? No, nope, it's not. It's way back on there. Well, James K. Polk will say a strange painting arrived at the White House. It was presented to him by General William Worth, that's where Fort Worth gets its name from, in honor of the Mexican-American War. When the soldiers went into fight, they followed the same path in New Mexico that Cortez followed. And it's an original copy of an original painting of Cortez, but whoever copied it left off the rest of his legs, feet, and the artist's signature. There's been times when I've been there by myself and I'm trying to get its eyes to move, but they stay there, so we're safe there too. You have to have an imagination. Well, anyway, it leads me to my last little story of the folks that one of my favorites, the beginning one and this one here. Now, they had celebrities back in the 1840s and the most famous celebrity is going to be General Tom Thumb, a little tiny man, he just stops growing. And he comes to visit James and Sarah in the White House, presents him with a cast of his foot and a cast of his hand. And in one of James's comedic times, which remember, he's not very good, he tells little Tom Thumb, I need to commission you as a soldier and have you go fight the Mexicans for me in the war. Tom Thumb says, well, the Mexicans are such bad shots, they can't even hit a regular sized target like you. How are they gonna get a little bitty person like that's James K. Folk's humor to end the tour. There's not much, you better take it. There ain't not much more to go. Now the fountain is original to our collection. Some were placed on Folk Place and this urn as well. And y'all were a great group of people to take on tour today. I really appreciate you coming and visiting us. And you have a great time. So y'all didn't get to pay or see the video, so I can get y'all signed up. This kitchen house. Since the kitchens were separate from the main house, and that's what this part is. Pretty cool. Okay, so we're off the tour. This is the sister's house where his sister lived. That's where his parents lived. And of course he lived there for a while. Of course he normally can go in there, but they're putting, they're doing some construction in there so we can't go in there, which stinks. Cause I don't know when we'll ever be able to get down here to See the rest of this stuff. Look at that fencing. <clears throat> so, uh, we're gonna walk over to the mansion where his other sister lived. It's supposed to be pretty impressive. Gorgeous house. Man. There's the gardens. Oh, look. Let's walk around the gardens. We're gonna go walk around the gardens. We'll be right back. Look at that maple. Man. It's huge. Anyways, here's the gardens on the Polk Estate. Must really be neat in the springtime when everything is flowering. A huge history buff. Driving 
we had to come check it out. Does it? <laughs> it was a little bit longer drive. Oh, check this out, Shane. It's already got vegetables and stuff for the kitchen house. That's what they used to do back in those days. So this whole estate is over 200 years old. Yeah, like I said, it's a little bit longer of a drive than I thought it would be to get here, but it's another one of those places that you don't really think of. It's not one of those big, huge tourist attraction type places that people flock to. It's one of those lesser known ones that are just as awesome to go to. So we jumped the chance to come here. Okay, so we're gonna go find his sister's mansion and we'll be back. Whole presidential hall. Is that what this is right here? Built in 1882. I don't remember them mentioning this place in the tour. Let's see if I can get back so I can get a better view of it. Polk Presidential Hall. I think that's it over there. The Walker Mansion, or I mean the, his sister. They said it was just up the, around the block from, they said that they, yeah, that's gotta be it. And it says on there that it was built in 1830. Is that what that sign said? And it looks like they're doing some restoration. Walker Simmons, 1830. So that's got to be it. Pretty cool. Be back. Check out this old Episcopal church right next door to the Polk place. Look at the auger. Look at the stained glass work on that. And check out. Organized in 1831. This building was built in 1861. So that building is over 150 years old. Wow. These old trees, I mean these huge trees here. This is just pretty cool. Tons of history in this whole area here. Columbia, Tennessee. Okay, be back. Neato. Okay, so that was the Polk 
residential home. Just a little side trip of ours. Me and little kiddo here. And hope you enjoyed that. We're on our way home. And that's it for this little minor adventure. Adios.